The other one that I was interested in was, was the, I believe it's called the Henneman size principle. Um, it's something, again, that, that people I've had talk, talk about it. You know, what, what's your view on that? Is that something you, you've spent any much time sort of figuring out? And, and where do you stand on that? So Henneman size principle, you know, it's a, an orderly recruitment of the smallest motor units to the largest, depending on the task at hand. So if I'm lifting you know, above 90% of one rep max, right away I'm activating all the motor units. The smaller threshold, the larger threshold, you know, the high threshold, whatever. But if I'm going lighter, say I'm doing lightweight. Say I do bench press 225 for a set of 20. Well, the first few reps are easy. I'm, I'm recruiting more of the low threshold ones. Now as the set goes on, I start recording higher and higher, but then towards the end of the set, I'm, I'm so fatigued, you know, the metabolites and all these things are inter interfering with my muscle force production, so I've got to call in more and more motor units to complete the task, such that at the very end, it's a slow, grindy rep. I end up, throughout that set, activating all the motor units, and that's why you get similar hypertrophy between lighter and heavier conditions. So based on that research, people said it's always best to train to failure because only on that last rep where you're grinding the weight out do you really stimulate all the motor units and do you really get maximum stimulus for adapting. And if you're just doing one set, you know, to failure, maybe that's the case. But when you do multiple sets, you know, there's a lot of evidence out there to support that going to failure is is not necessary and in some cases counterproductive. So you don't need to always go to failure. Sometimes leaving a rep or two in the tank leads to better results. So you, we got Henneman's size principle, but then we have this theory, but if the experiments don't completely match the theory, then the theory's wrong. Maybe it's the case that if you do four sets, you can get so fatigued on that first set that then your next few sets suck, or, so it's better to just leave a couple reps in the tank so that you can have four high quality sets or something like that, or maybe there's a different explanation. But that has implications for all these advanced techniques, which I'm a fan of all of them, and I think you need to learn when to use them. You know, on my last set of curls, I don't just keep them strict and then be done. On my last two reps, I'm going, and I heave it up, but then I do a controlled lowering, you know, and I feel like those last, that last rep I feel my biceps. I feel like that was the most quality that last, but I did a cheat rep. Right. So cheat reps, drop sets, you know, all these different, there's so many advanced techniques, you know, uh, f f forced reps, partials, all these different techniques. They all have implications, you know, heavy negatives, things like that, um, accentuated eccentrics, enhanced eccentrics. They're all different types. We use 20 of them here <laughs> in glute lab. But... If failure training isn't optimal, then why would going way, way past failure be optimal? For example, if you do a set of shrugs or lateral raises, and the research shows that you don't have to completely go to failure, then why would going to complete failure, you know, I grab, I grab the, the hundreds for dumbbell shrugs, and I do 30 reps, then I immediately go to the 90s, and I do 10 then I go to the 80s and do eight, and then I go all the way down to the tens, <laughs> and I have tens, and I'm going, ugh. That's probably overkill, you know, and it can, it can, it can lead to overreaching, mm. but you can spin your wheels with it. So you've got so you you to be smart about the advanced techniques that you yeah, use. Yeah, because also I was, I was watching you talk about that in that when you are doing those advanced techniques or even going to kind of failure, that depending on the type of muscle group and the exercise that you're training, um, Failure is different. Like you, I think you was giving an example of these sort of side laterals with the bands and deadlifts, and saying like, you know, if someone came with a gun to your head and you did your max on a deadlift, they're going to shoot you. Whereas if someone said, right, you know, give me ten more side laterals, you could just keep doing them. Um, so there's different, yeah, there's different types of failure. So I've talked about this a lot. There's different types of failure. For example, if I, my, my the most I've ever deadlifted is six fifty. When I did that rep, if someone came up with a gun and said, I'm going to shoot you if you don't get one more, I can't get another. I'm dead. There's no matter how bad I want it, I can't get a second rep. 
I hate when people go, it's all about mind over matter. It's all about, my, okay, then go deadlift 3,000 pounds. Go set the, <laughs> go set the world record then if it's all about mind over matter. There's physics to this, you know. There's muscles that attach to bones and create torque, and there's only so much that can be done here. And it, you hear people be like, no, if, if you have this adrenaline surge, average people can, you know, if a woman has her baby trapped, she can leg press a car and launch it, you know, flip a car over. Okay, then where are videos of this? Where's the evidence? There's only, if that were true, you could just, you know, take a shot of adrenaline right before a lift and then crush it. And if that were true, you would see that our voluntary activation would be very low. Like, you can, you can do an exercise, say a curl, and then you can shock the muscle while you do that curl, and then you subtract out, you look at the number of motor units recruited versus the maximal during being shocked, and then you see what percentage you're using. And most people, you know, beginners are at like, say, say, say 90%, but advanced lifters will be at like 98%. So you're only leaving a couple percent untapped. There's only so much extra room possible, you know. So I, I don't buy it. I don't buy it. Where are the videos of these things happening? We've had cameras up for a long time. Anyway, um, so I think... Uh, so failure is a complicated thing. Failure is really complicated. Define. So with, there's this, it's called the central governor model. With a lot of cardiovascular things and high rep things, it's your mind telling you, you know, you know, I remember this guy telling this story about how he's running this marathon and he's like, I have the worst blister and he can just feel it and he just kept running. He's like, I have to stop. I have to stop. And he kept going for miles, but eventually he's just like, I can't do it anymore. This blister is ruining my, my race. I'm gonna, it's going to be so bad. So he went and sat down, took his shoe off. There was no blister there. It was his mind playing tricks on him. How powerful is that, you know? And so that's called the central governor model. It's not really your muscles failing. It's your brain. It's, it's uncomfortable. That can probably be trained, obviously, to get a better you know, pain tolerance or something, or, or uh, but, uh, mental toughness, whatever. But... With high rep stuff, yeah, you're doing lateral band walks and you're like, oh my God, it's burning so bad. Rarely do you really go so bad to where you're like on the floor, crumbled over, like, you know, some of my clients go that hard, but usually you're like, you stop your set, but if, yeah, same scenario, someone had a gun, you could have done 10 more. Hmm. If someone said, do 10 more, you'd be like, okay, I'm burning so bad, but then you'd get 10 more. So you're not really going to failure with those, but there's other types of failure too, but yeah. It's a complicated topic, and it's more nuanced than people say. So when people say, should I go to failure, or should I not go to failure? Yes, you should go to failure some of the time, and not other time. It's a nuanced topic. I hate when people answer it with a yes or no answer. It's nuanced. you yeah. you, you got to describe how and when, and there's a lot of gray area in that. And one of the things, uh, we've interviewed quite a few bodybuilders, and I interviewed Dorian Yates as an example. So he was really the, the sort of go to failure, maximum ma amount uh -huh. of weight. I interviewed Frank Zane, that's very different. He's about, you know, keeping yourself safe, not, not being injured. So, in terms of sort of exercises and adaption, so that you are, when you get to your 40s, 50s, 60s, you're not creating problems for yourselves, have you found that there are some sort of rules that, Yes, they're going to get you those you know, strength, muscle gains that you're after, but you're also not going to create some serious problems as you get older, like a lot of these bodybuilders have. You know, they're, they're, some of them are in a mess, you know, backs and... So Ronnie Coleman, for example, right. Um, so, yeah, good question. So what I would say is you go to failure, but fa your failure is technical failure, you know? We can all... When I do stiff leg deadlifts, you know... I think my record is 405 for 20. I mean, I even got 22 once. I can stiff leg 405 for 20. <laughs> but if I'm super arched, I might be able to only be able to get 405 for 10. But I can round my, my back a little bit, especially my upper back. But I know how much is, you know, I know how much I can get away with where it doesn't hurt the next day. If, but if I'm like, say I just haven't been training them a lot or I'm just, it's not a good day, and I'm, you know, and I'm doing my set. Let's say I round too far. 
let's say I'm just like, I'm not going to care what my, I'm just going to round as far as possible and just, and then I end up with an injury. Or you just, you, you do put more stress on those structures. So I would say definitely you can go to failure, but make it good technical failure. And like, you know, bench press, it's hard to scrub. It's like, you know, of course people can bounce it and lift their butt up. But like, say you have a normal bench press, it's not hard to, but there's some exercise like deadlifts where you can, you can have some ugly, ugly, like it's where it's just painful to watch. So that's what I would say, like, don't, uh, don't extend the set to where the reps look ugly. Have all the reps, the set ends when you can't pull off a pretty rep. Mm -hmm. And then if you're the type that goes to failure, that really pushes hard, we've all seen them. You know, if you're a trainer, you know, you've got a few types of people who just push so hard. And then you've got some people who don't push it that hard. Well, the people who push it super hard, you don't give them as many sets. And the people who don't push it hard, you give them more sets. That's how they see better results. And so a lot of my strongest girls, their workouts, they're doing 10 to 15 sets a day. That's it. They're not doing 20 sets a day. They're not doing 30 sets a day. You think 10 sets? Really? Yes. I can crush them with 10 sets. They can crush themselves with 10 sets. You don't have to always be doing super high volume, especially if you're the type that pushes it hard. And especially if you're the type that never deloads and doesn't periodize your effort and things like that. So that would be 10 sets per body part? Per workout. Per no, workout. like their workout, they're doing lower body. Right. And it might be three sets of pause, pause full squats, three sets of, you know, bar plus band hip thrusts, two sets of stiff leg deadlifts, one set of dumbbell walking lunges, and a triple drop set on the seated hip abduction machine. That's and if you're thing. strong and you're going for PRs, that's a brutal workout. I would have so many people listening to this that goes, they would think that's it? Really? I could, I could do so much more than that? And it's these same people that are weak. You know, I have so many people that I need something more advanced. That's a wimpy workout. And I go, oh, you need something more advanced. How many chin-ups can you do? Well, none. Why? You're not advanced. You need to be working on your chin-ups. Three sets of negatives is hard. Three sets of three negatives where you're really fighting. The problem is you go watch them lift and they're going three sets of negatives. They don't sit there and go, until <laughs> they're shaking and, and then go all the way to here and you're still, <laughs> you know what I mean? They don't know how to train hard. <laughs> so you got all this stuff on the internet too because you got these people that don't really train anyone. I'm one of the few trainers that works with bikini competitors that's popular who trains people in real life. So a lot of people out there, you look at these workouts and they're crazy. They're crazy. But a lot of the bikini competitors don't train. You watch their workouts and you're like, they don't train that hard. They just kind of go through the motions. They're not pushing themselves that hard. So sometimes that works out well for them. But if you train, I don't want to say properly, but if you, if you train hard, you can't be busting out 30 sets in a workout. It's, 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 I wish people could do these workouts <laughs> themselves and see how daunting, how hard they are, you know? Mm -hmm.